Okay, let's get started. Um, okay, so if you come in late, um, go ahead and pick up your homework and midterm, midterm, and I think the beach lab is back there as well after class. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit about some of these things in just a second here. Okay, so uh, the schedule this week, we're going to go back to the sort of uh, regular lecture plus discussion in midweek. Um, this week, you're going to be starting to think about your final projects. And so for Wednesday, um, I'm going to have a kind of workshop on how to find primary sources. Um, as I'm reading through uh, some of your writing, I'm realizing that many of you may not know what primary sources are. Um, because you're basing a lot of your stuff just on news articles. And in fact, there are scientific articles that are behind those articles. So uh, I'm going to be talking about how you find those scientific articles, how you read those scientific articles, how you cite those scientific articles. Okay? So that'll be on Wednesday at 4, and then we have a regular problem session at 7. Um, hopefully, you remember that to yesterday was the homework for turn in. I got a few of them. Okay. Uh, the next homework assignment, homework 5, because we sort of got onto the cycle is also going to do Monday. So that's probably going to be the homework deadline for the rest of the quarter is on the Monday. Okay? So that's not supposed to come on. Um, all right, but Thursday, uh, and I'm sorry, this is actually wrong. Not Thursday, but Friday, uh, your uh, your projects, your, your project proposals will be due. Uh, so let's talk a little bit about the pro class project. So there's three parts of this. Um, I've actually now put up on TED just like 10 minutes ago a full description of what the class project is, sort of all the different components, um, what you should be looking for and all these things. So I'm just going to kind of summarize it here in class, but make sure you read that document. Um, and then you can ask questions afterwards. So the idea is to kind of go back. So we're already in your news reports, you're starting to look at sort of the sort of newest news uh, and different sort of science uh, about uh, life in the universe and are we alone and astrobiology and stuff like that. Um, now to synthesize more than one article together, uh, now, it can be on one topic, but you should be looking for at least two primary sources related to your topic. Now, many of you in your news reports have brought in other papers, and so that you've already started on that process. But for those of you who have just looked at the news, you know, whatever the news article is, and just kind of quote what's there, this is going to be a lot more in-depth. And so that's why, if, if you're not quite sure how to do that, that's why you should show up on Wednesday. There should be at least two primary uh, sources. And the proposal is just one paragraph in your bibliography, and that paragraph should describe what your topic is, how it's related to the course, and uh, a kind of brief description of your creative component or presentation component, which I'll talk about in just a second. Okay? So three things, what your topic is, how it's related to the course, and what the sort of project is in sort of a couple sentences. This is only meant to be a paragraph. It's not meant to be really deep. It's mostly so I can get a sense of what everyone's doing, and mostly to make sure you're not trying to do something that's not going to be possible which happens a lot. Okay. So that's due this Friday. There's a turn it in assignment now on the TED site, so you can turn that in. There's a whole now course project sort of folder on the TED site where you can turn this in. All right, that's 10% of this, this project grade. Uh, the other major part of it is, of course, the write-up, which is going to be due at the end of ninth week, also in TED. This is three to five pages, so it's not a huge paper, right? but three to five pages. And, and again, it's kind of the same themes summarizing the science of the articles that you read, their relation to the course, or you're making connections to the course material. Um, and then if you have a creative component or a presentation component, describing how you translated the science into whatever creative component that you've done. Okay, So there's still kind of the same three things. Of course, again, a bibliography of at least the two primary sources, if not other sources that you brought in as you sort of develop this project. All right, so that'll be due on Friday, uh, May 28th, the end of next week. And then uh, originally I wasn't quite sure if I wanted to have everyone do a presentation and if I had wanted to have everyone do a creative component, so I'm going to leave it up to you. You have a choice. You can either do a creative project 
or you can do a presentation, a 10 minute presentation in class, kind of like the news report presentations, but uh, quite a bit souped up. Um, so this is, I'm leaving this to you. I would say that it's a lot more fun to do a creative project than a, you know, PowerPoint slide presentation, but you know, that's, that's sort of in your wheelhouse. So what do you want to do? Um, the creative project can really be anything. So I have had like, I've done this now for about five years. I have a huge array of examples. Let me show you actually one example. Uh, you can tell that I like it because I kept it. These are the Galilean moons. And those in the front row can probably tell that these are baked. And you can still smell the sugar. So one of the students was really into baking and making like cakes and stuff like that. And she figured out how to bake the Galilean moons to the right sizes with the right surface features and in fact actually even the right densities. The densities are actually fairly close to what they're supposed to be. All right, so this is an example of a very successful creative project, right? Taking some aspect of the course material and doing something that you enjoy that's related to that course material. All right, so something like a song, something like a poem, uh, you know, a video, a story, a performance, there's all sorts of ways that you can take this. The other option, as I said, is to, you can also do a 10 minute presentation, a slide, uh, you know, a sort of PowerPoint slide presentation in class. Both of these will actually involve presenting your work in the 10th week. I've sort of set aside the entire 10th week so everyone can sort of present what they've done for their project. So you can either do a very formal presentation or an informal, here's a project I did, here's how it's related. Okay. Um, let's see. Here's some more examples. So yeah, here's the picture of those moons. Here's some more examples. Like a couple years ago, someone made a card game on planet formation. So you, it was kind of like a, you know, like a build up your card deck until you have life kind of thing. Card game, very fun. We played it in class. Um, a few years ago, someone wrote a, a really nice song about moon phases that I actually play when I do uh, outreach to elementary school kids. Beautiful song. Um, there was a really unusual dance interpretation of planet formation. I didn't quite understand it, but it was cool. Um, folks have done computer simulations, looked at cultural perspectives of the evolution of the solar system, history of the solar system. Um, we've had a couple of students actually do research projects with folks here, you know, kind of weak, you know, mini research project like we need to work or something like that. All right, all of these things are perfectly valid, and there's many, many more ideas that I probably didn't think of. This is, by the way, one of the poems that was done a couple years ago. And it's a really nice kind of structural poem. And it's all about panspermia and stuff going between Venus and Earth. And, you know, a really relatively simple but deeply thought out poem. I, I actually get a lot of poems, and many of the poems are not that good. So if you're not a poet, you know, there is a quality aspect to the, to the creative poems and also, of course, to the presentation as well. So again, think about something that you really enjoy. If you like to draw, draw something. If you like to do fashion, I had a fashion. Uh, you know, what is the fashion of Venusians and Martians kind of thing, All right? Think of something that you're into and then see if you can adapt it. Okay, any questions on that? Yes. This is um, group based, right? This is individual. Individual. Individual, yes. So I think the original, so I have to change the original project, the sort of uh, course management. When there was going to be about like 40 or 50 students in here, I was like, I'm not reading 40 or 50 individual papers. But you're now down to 25, and that's manageable. So this is individual. Now, if you want to do related topics, that's fine. All right. And I should say, the purpose of the proposal is not is also so that I can see kind of what you're thinking, what you're doing. But if you want to do something that's related, like if, if the, you two want to do something that's kind of similar to each other, you do have to do separate projects and separate write-ups. But if they tie into the same kind of ideas, I will consider it. But all of your project proposals have to be reviewed in advance. Okay. And this is 20% of your grade, by the way. This is worth more than I think the midterm. Yeah. Wait, so the proposals and write-ups and all that is individual, but if you want to present it together, can you do that? I will think about it. It depends how the presentation goes. 
but your your proposal, your write up, and whatever you hand into me, if you have like some kind of product for your for your creative project, has to be separate. If you're doing a presentation, it has to be twenty minutes each of you talking for ten. Question. This is the funnest part of this course, I think, both for me and usually for students who take the class. So, you know, you don't look excited, <laughs> but you should be excited. This is a way to actually translate the material we're talking about into something that's actually more fun. Yes, sir. You pretty much have to decide if you're going to do Presentation. Yeah, sorry. For your proposal, you should note whether you want to do a creative or a presentation there. So think about it during the week. Okay. Questions? Yes, ma'am. Uh, the slide, it said uh, Friday the 28th, but Friday's the 29th. Yeah, sorry, it should be Friday the 29th. Friday the 29th. The Friday. But the creative, actually, this should be the 20. So I'm off by a day here. But the, whatever you have for a creative project, please turn it into the class. Because otherwise, I don't know how to get it. OK. So again, this is a major portion of your grade. This is, again, worth more than the midterm. And it's worth more than the, it's worth about the same as the final. Um, and so please take it seriously. But don't overdo it. Right. The estimate is this should be something between 15 and 20 hours of your time. So if you're trying to make a two-hour documentary, stop right now because you're not going to do that in 20 hours. Right. But you know, if you're just giving me a shoebox with like some rocks in it, work harder. So so there's a range. Someone's giving me a shoebox with rocks in it. So okay. All right. So um, all right. Next thing I want to talk about is the midterm. Uh, so uh, midterm grades were okay. There was a very big range in scores, which suggests some of you are staying up with material and some of you are really not staying up with material. Um, so please use this as a measure of what you should be focusing on, what you should be studying, uh, and where you should be putting your efforts. Um, there were a few questions that uh, I wanted to point out had sort of a lot of, of folks not answering them right. Uh, the numbers question always gets people a lot. Um, I had some incredibly heavy and not heavy people in this class, right? Uh, you know, 10 to the minus 6 kilograms is definitely not your weight. And neither is 3 times 10 to the 6 kilograms. 300 million, 3 million kilograms is not your weight, right? So if you're having trouble with these numeric answers, I want you to go back and review this, review, review the, the lecture in which we talked about this, which I think was lecture 1 or 2. Um, Knowing the numbers of the universe is actually an important thing, right? It's kind of like knowing people's names. If you understand the scales of things in the universe, you understand a lot more about the universe itself. So knowing what a light year means and how it relates to the scale of stars is actually pretty important to talking about, for example, where the nearest civilizations might be and how we might communicate with them. Right? So these scales are important. Yes, ma'am. Yeah. Time Homo sapiens have been on Earth. Uh, sorry, actually, this is wrong. I have this wrong in the notes. It's, it's in the five. So even I need to know my numbers. But yeah, it's 100,000 100, years. Sorry, that's the old solutions. Uh, it's 100,000 years. All right. Uh, and again, this is important for knowing you know, how long an advanced intelligence civilization be around. Humans weren't around 100,000 years ago. So maybe we're not going to be around 100,000 years from now, not to any cataclysm, but because maybe we're something else. Right? This is sort of evolutionary time scales to think about. Right? So all these scales are important, so we're thinking about these questions that we're talking about in class. Are we alone? How do we contact folks, et cetera, et cetera. Knowing the scales are important. Um, this one, I think maybe two people got right. So resistance bacteria is an example of most of you selected natural selection. Uh, antibiotics, how long have antibiotics been around? Since the dawn of time, throughout the history of the of the Earth, 
Any guesses? How recently? Give me a number. Last decade? Probably older than that. Probably older than that. Because I got sick more than a decade ago to get about it, so I can prove that. Last few years? So I, probably 100, 200 years, something like that. This is modern, this is medicine, right? Antibiotics is something that we've created. Now, there are natural antibiotics in the environment, but not to the degree of which you would get them prescribed and have a serious impact on you know, disease and stuff like that. So antibiotics are medicine created by humans. And that's a source of artificial selection. All right, so the, the, our ability to wipe out certain pathogens with these antibiotics uh, is, is something that we've developed in medicine. Now, of course, if you don't take your full antibiotic strain or your run, then your bacteria start to develop resistance. Actually, what happens is some bacteria have mutated, and those mutations which are able to survive the antibiotic do a lot better than the bacteria that have not gotten the antibiotic survival uh, gene, and they went out. And the next time you try to take antibiotics, <coughs> nothing happens. Right? That's an example of artificial selection. We have actually helped antibiotic resistance bacteria to emerge on this planet because we give antibiotics. Right? This is one of the big crises in medicine today. So that's an example of artificial selection, not natural selection. Artificial selection. Um, this was a question that I, I uh, went very briefly in the notes, but this is the Stefan Boltzmann law. The fact that if you that the brightness of the source scales is temperature to the fourth power. Right? So that's one of the equations you actually had in your exam. Right? So this is an example of making sure you know what the equations are in your, in your equation sheet and how to use them. Um, many of you answered the fundamental force holding the nuclei of atoms together as the electromagnetic force. Electromagnetic force does the opposite. Electromagnetic force is actually driving the nuclei apart. How come? So with same charge what? What are the particles called? Protons, right. So nuclei is made of positive protons, neutral neutrons. Neutral neutrons don't care about the charge at all. all right? But protons are positive, positive repels, and they're right next to each other. They repel hugely. So without this extra strong force, no nuclei. All, right? all we have is hydrogen atoms. That's it. Right. So electromagnetic force is definitely not holding atoms together. It's the thing that's driving them apart. You have to have a strong force to hold, hold atoms together, nuclei together. Right. So knowing your forces are important. Um, a couple of you got this, and I had a note by one of one of you guys that says I actually looked at the full mo the moon the day before. How many of you looked at the exam from last year? You looked at the moon before. I think you're the ones that got it. Yeah. yeah. All right. So. Uh, Part of my, you know, point in asking this question is making sure that you're looking at the world around you. All right. Part of science is observation. Part of astrobiology, like the universe, is observation. Um, we had a night lab looking at the moon. You could actually have figured out this question by just remembering when we had the night lab, because in the night lab you drew down what the phase of the moon was then. And that was about three or four weeks ago, which is about a moon phase. And it turns out the moon phase at the time was waxing dim as well. Right. So you can also figure this out just from time scales, but be observant. Be observant. All right. The, now this one is the one I think had the most trouble, which I was a bit surprised because you had essentially this question on your homework assignment, homework three, but I didn't give you these energy things, right? These energy forms. And most of you got that homework question right, and most of you got this totally wrong. So I want to go through this a little bit because it seems like there's a disconnect between what you're doing in the homework and what you're actually discussing in the, in the class. Um, so this is an example of uh, an energy flow or energy structure diagram. I've talked about energy sort of incessantly in the last five weeks. I'm going to continue talking about it, so note that this is something that's very important because having some idea of the relationship, how energy flows between the system, gives you an idea of if you change the system, what happens to that system? And that's what the follow-up question is about. All right, so I've actually given you the different forms of energy that exist in the atmosphere, 
in space, in the atmosphere, and down on the ground, all right? Radiation and heat are really the two things that you worry about in this kind of problem, all right? And then I'm actually giving you the processes, transmission, absorption, reflection, thermal emission, that radiation undergoes, radiation and heat undergo as you transform between these things, right? So this is really just connecting all these pieces together. Now, transmission, absorption, reflection, thermal emission, what are those? Let's take it one at a time. What is it, when I say absorption, what does that mean? This may be why so many got this wrong. What does absorption mean? Yes. You take in light. So take in light. So light takes into what? Where does the light go? Uh, into the atmosphere. Well, okay, that might be if we put it here, but it's into the atmosphere, into the matter of the atmosphere, right? Into the material into the atoms. Right? These are all processes which radiation and matter interact with each other. Right? We spend some time talking about this because this is the process of energy transformation. When you have elements in your atmosphere that are material, right? how they interact with radiation is how energy transforms between radiation and this other form, which is heat. Right? So absorption is going from radiation as a form of energy to what is a form of energy? Heat. 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 Right? That is a transformation process between two different forms of energy. Now, if I've got radiation in space here, right, that's flying all over the place. But if it interacts the atmosphere, what can happen? Okay, thank you. It gets absorbed. You're the only one in the class today, it seems. All right? It gets absorbed. That's a transformation from one form of energy, radiation, to another form of energy, which is heat. You follow me? Yeah. All right. All right. That's transformation. So these diagrams are meant to show how energy transforms. And one of the ways it can transform is to go from light to heat by absorption. Now, many of you like to put absorption between all these things. For example, heat is absorbed into radiation, and radiation is absorbed into radiation. That's not, that's not absorption. That's the same form of energy, right? Absorption is a transformation of energy. So you've got to go from one form to another. And absorp absorption is light going away because it goes into another piece of matter, which is, which is then going to right? transform the energy. All right, what about transmission? What is transmission in words? OK, so light starts off as what form of energy? So radiation, heat is not a form of light. Heat is what matter does. Heat is the random motion of atoms. So radiation doesn't have any atoms, so it can't be heat. So you start with radiation, and then what do you end up with? Radiation, all right? So if I was drawing an arrow between radiation that was a transmission arrow, where's the only place that arrow can go? To a form of radiation. Right. So again, maybe you put transmission kind of bouncing all through here, but radiation is a transformation from radiation to radiation. It's actually not a transformation. It's just passing through matter. Right. You're just moving the energy from one place to another, but it's the same form. So understanding how these things are actually transforming different forms of energy allows you to draw these maps very easily. Right. So transmission is here. I'm going to shorten this down so it's easy. And it can also go both ways. So transmission is going both directions. All right, so absorption is radiation to heat. That means anywhere I have radiation, I can have absorption going into it. All right, radiation goes down to the ground and it gets absorbed. All right, radiation is 
radiation, sorry, absorption is radiation to heat. What is uh, thermal emission? What are the two end points of energy? No, just, just general forms of energy, right? These are forms of energy, radiation, heat, mass might be a form of energy, chemical bonds might be a form of energy. I only got two of here, radiation and heat. So what is thermal emission? Going from what to what? Heat radiation. Heat radiation. Thermal is temperature. Temperature is a measure of heat. This is built into the words, folks. All right. So if you're going from thermal heat to radiation, it's an emission process. Where are these arrows going to be? Yes, from all the ones that go from heat to radiation. So heat here is emission. Heat to radiation is emission. Heat to radiation is emission. All of these things are here. Now, many of you just put one set of arrows that went through, you know, radiation to heat, radiation to heat, down to the atmosphere, and done. Right? But anytime you have heat, you can have thermal emission. Right? <coughs> Everything that has a temperature emits light. That's the black body distribution. So anytime you have something that has heat, it's going to emit light. And it's going to emit light into, you know, from one form of just heat to a form of just radiation. So you've got to connect those arrows up all the way. All right, the last thing was reflection. What is reflection? What are the endpoints of the forms of energy? Light. Okay, radiation to? To the speed of The form of energy. Radiation. Thank you, yes. Light to light, right? Reflection is light bouncing off a mirror. That's still light when it comes off, right? Now, it doesn't make it through stuff because it bounces off. And so all reflection does is return you back to where you are. This is the, the full arrow diagram for the energy processes in this, in, this, uh, in this system. And I think maybe two of you got all of these down. It comes from knowing the definitions of these processes. Right? Transmission is radiation to radiation through a material. Radiation, radiation through a material. Right? Trans uh, emission, thermal emission, is heat to radiation. Anything that has heat is going to emit light. Heat to light. Heat to light, heat to light. All of those are there. Okay. Now, why does it matter to have this full diagram? Well, the next question was, uh, you know, what happens if the the greenhouse gas absorbing molecules, carbon dioxide, water, methane, disappear in the atmosphere? Right? Many of you sort of, you know, concluded that the Earth must cool, but didn't actually have a logical flow to how that might happen. <coughs> Many of you said, well, okay, if this isn't absorbed as much, right, then this, this arrow might go away. Although many of you didn't actually have that arrow in your diagram. Right? Okay, so that arrow might go away, right? Turns out this arrow will also go away. Okay. How does that affect the land? What happens next? Yes. Um, if there's like no absorption, then the greenhouse um, gas is like you can't trap anything, so they, they wouldn't get trapped. So they're then they would stay in the. the okay. So let's take it. So the. The greenhouse gases have gone, already gone away in the problem. So if they escape in space, that's kind of the you know situation that I've, I've completely made up out of the blue. So whether they stay trapped or not physically still doesn't connect us to the ground. That's just what's happening in the atmosphere. It has nothing to do with the ground yet. Yeah. So what happens if I remove the absorption of heat 
sorry, the absorption, yeah, the absorption of radiation from the ground and from space in the atmosphere. What happens in the atmosphere when I get rid of that energy transformation process? Yes. Will, will it get dark? Light. Well, this is not light, this is heat. If I stop dumping rate energy from here and here into here, what happens to this? Okay. What is this? Say, say it louder. So I haven't gotten rid of the material, it's still there. Thank you. Okay, so you lose heat energy, right? You're transforming radiation energy into heat energy. You don't put the radiation energy into heat energy, you have less heat energy, right? This is a flow diagram. This is the whole point of these diagrams, is tracing where the energy is. This is like if you're, you know, if you're trying to you know, prosecute the mob, you look where the money goes, because the money leads you to the bad people, right? This is leading to where the energy goes and where it's not going. So if you get rid of these arrows, you have less heat, so this is colder. All right, so I proved that the atmosphere is colder. How does that relate to the ground? What happens next? How does a colder atmosphere change this diagram? Good. Emission depends on what quality of heat. Now that's the same word again. What physical quantity? Temperature, yeah. So if the temperature goes down, the brightness of the cloud goes down by a lot, right? It's temperature to the fourth power. That's the whole black body picture. So if this gets colder, these get weaker. Maybe they go away. All right? Now what happens if I got rid of this emission feature? Trace the flow, guys. This, I've gotten rid of the emission from the atmosphere, which is a big jump, but I'm just going to assume that's the case. What happens next if I've gotten rid of that arrow that pointed from here to here? There's less absorbed into the ground. Uh, the ground's way down here. There was no arrow connecting that to that. Well, the you're going too the far, you're going too far ahead. From the atmosphere to the radiation in the atmosphere, and then the radiation in the atmosphere to the ground. So, so don't combine these steps. Take it one at a time. I reduce the amount of energy going from heat to radiation. So what happens to the energy of radiation? It goes down. That's it, right? This goes down. It's darker. There's less light. There's less radiation. There's less radiation of energy. Okay, step by step. All right, if there's less radiation of energy here, what happens, for example, to this arrow? That might also get reduced. All right, so now there's less radiation. There's probably also less reflection, right? There's lots of things that way. So now there's less radiation going into here. What happens to the heat of the ground? It gets cold, okay? So that's the logical flow. But you've got to follow the flow. You can't just say, you know, carbon dioxide goes away, and so the ground gets colder. There's several steps in between. And importantly, the steps in between is that what matters ultimately is how much light is in the atmosphere of our planet. Right? It actually, you know, it backs out from the carbon dioxide stuff like that. But the ultimate cause is that there's just less light, less infrared light. We're looking at a cold, cold cloud. So it's generating less heat to backward the atmosphere, backward the Earth. That's the logical flow. So that's how you use these diagrams. You can't just jump ahead because there's, you know, there could be other things that it's put in here. Maybe the carbon dioxide uh, goes up and I absorb more radiation from space unless it gets through. There's lots of ways of arguing these things. But if you follow the flow of energy, you can make a logical argument to explain why the surface of the Earth is getting older. 
by not drawing, unless you draw on all those errors, you can't make those logical arguments. You're just assuming, you're just repeating back some fact, which, you know, now you know where it comes from. It comes from this energy flow. By the way, what happens after this? If this gets colder, let's keep going. That emits less light, okay, which makes this even down further. All right. So maybe there's less reflected up here, which means this goes down further. Actually, I've already gotten rid of the absorption thing. Everything gets colder. It's a feedback process. Right? So you don't get a little colder, you get a lot colder. Because everything feeds back to the But you don't know that unless you use the whole energy diagram. So so don't don't be lazy on the arrows. Put all the arrows in. Consider all of the processes that I've listed there. And then follow the flow. Because that's the only way you really understand these systems. Okay? Questions on this? You will see something like this again, I guarantee it. Okay, last thing, we're already halfway in. Um, so I started to review your news reports. Uh, so most of those grades are now up. Um, I am a bit troubled because uh, one of the reasons that I'm using the Turnitin software is to address sort of past issues of uh, what I've seen as sort of copying from the internet. Um, this is a blurred out to protect the, uh, the innocent uh, uh, example of one of the news reports uh, that was submitted this year, this, this quarter, and all the things you see in colored highlights are things copied directly from the internet. So something like 70% of this particular report is directly copied from the internet. That's plagiarism. That is not tolerated at UCSD. Now I know that these are short articles, and maybe you're writing them very quickly and you may not fully understand them, but copying stuff from the internet and not attributing it or just having quotes throughout the whole article is not count as a written article. Right? These have to be written by you. Now one of the reasons that I did this, did the news reports is to catch this early because I knew it would come up. Right? Your final paper will be compared in the same sense. You must write your own papers. Right? Let me say it again. You must write your own papers. If it's a difficult science topic and you're not quite sure, get help. But don't just copy and paste things. That is not writing. And, you know, the software has caught up to you. So please don't do it. Okay? All right. Okay. Uh, so today we've got two identical news reports. So, David, you want to come first? Sure. All right. Um, I don't have any papers. Okay. Kath, uh, Kurt, can you go into the room over there and just grab some of the paper out of the photocopy machine and just tear it in pieces? Yeah. So the title of my article is up here, and uh, this week did dinosaur the did the dinosaur killing asteroid that we attribute to the KT extinction uh, actually caused cause a chain reaction of volcanic eruptions throughout the planet. And uh, so basically, uh, ge geophysicists from UC Berkeley have found evidence that links uh, like a huge chain reaction of volcanic eruptions like. Uh, flood basalt eruptions, actually, in particular, to the uh, the meteor, the asteroid impact from was it, six, the oh, sorry, I'm really bad at uh, social interactions and stuff, but uh, uh, you want to do it from here? So, okay. Um, 
All right. So uh, Mark Richards from one of the UC Berkeley uh, physics departments, I think, uh, proposed in 1989 that approximately every 20 to 30 million years, uh, magma plumes rise up a huge, I guess, I guess I'd call it a pool of magma, rises up through the through through Earth and eventually leads to like large large scale volcanic eruptions and uh, these are flood basalt eruptions which have uh, been attributed to like four of the last six I think uh, max mass extinctions and. Uh, Uh, okay. Another thing that can um, like speed up the volcanic eruption process is really large scale earthquakes. Like anything greater than a problem, uh, like 9.0 can uh, trigger uh, nearby volcanic activity. And um, the, the theory is that the, the asteroid that hit the earth and is thought to have uh, led to the extinction of the dinosaurs was capable of causing a 9.0 equivalent earthquake almost globally, which may have led to uh, a lot of global eruptions, like not just in the, not just the one in the, uh, I think the one they're treating it to is the, the Deccan traps in India. And uh, so like, it wasn't just local, uh, it probably caused volcanic eruptions globally and uh, since these are attributed to the flood basalt eruptions, um, it's like that's a lot of carbon dioxide into the atmosphere, as well as uh, from the homework we learned that also causes uh, hydrogen sulfide in the oceans to increase like, the, the bacteria. So, and this. Uh, uh, like these eruptions are thought to have also uh, along with the asteroid impact itself, led to the extinction of the dinosaurs. Um, and there's a uh, and the evidence for the uh, asteroid impact having or being around the same time as the eruptions is like. There's, I think they're finding more and more evidence. Um, they've, I think they've dated it to be the extinction and, or like they've, they've, uh, they've dated the two uh, events to be within 100,000 years of each other, which uh, uh, according to one of the uh, geophysicists from Berkeley, this uh, can't just be mere coincidence. Like they, it's a very low chance that they're just randomly happen to happen around the same time. And uh, more evidence for the, the asteroid to have sped up the volcanic eruption. They actually have like lay, the, the layered sediments from the continuous uh, flood basalt eruptions. There's the, the pre-asteroid impact layers and the post-asteroid impact layers actually are uh, chemically different. So there's that as well, and then uh, that's about all I got. Right, thank you. Um, any questions? Take one question. Thank you. Are those like just like pools <laughs> like? Surrounding all of Earth, there's just six specific areas that I think it's usually just uh, local plumes. They're like, but like they, they there's um, like it's not a giant plume surrounding the entire entire globe. It'll be like separate ones in different locations. Okay, thank you, Dan. Um, yeah. I don't actually see Michael, so I think we are not going to double up, so that's okay. Okay. All right. So um, 
please uh, provide some feedback for Daniel on uh, both the slide presentation and also his presentation. And thank you for, for coming up and uh, giving that. Um, all right, so you're going to skip Michael uh, and get into what we're going to talk about today. So um, actually, this is a, a really good topic for uh, what we're talking about today because today we're going to kind of finish off life on Earth, literally, because we're going to talk about extinctions. Um, uh, but also talk about how they gave, uh, gave rise, to, uh, how life sort of initially started, as far as we know it. Um, so uh, given time, I'm not going to talk too much about genetics, but I want to sort of touch briefly because this is going to be important on how we understand that this life starts to develop. Now hopefully by now you understand a little bit about this or how DNA works. We've got these four nucleobases, A, T, C, and G. Um, they pair up through hydrogen bonding. Um, they only pair up in sort of pairs of TAs and CGs, and this is how information, at least in sort of our heredity, is encoded uh, in this fairly complex molecule, right? This sort of quaternary code uh, of the nucleobases. Uh, again, this is, these, you know, these DNA and also RNA molecules, all right, uh, dioxyribonucleus and ribonucleic acid, are common for all life on Earth, and things that we're not quite sure if we call them life. Stuff like viruses also contain RNA and DNA. So something about this particular molecule and the way that it stores information uh, has been critical for the development of life, at least here on Earth. Can I ask you to put your phone away, please? <sighs> All right, now the only difference is that RNA uses one slightly different nucleobase instead of the uh, thiamine, uh, which is right here. It uses uracil, but nonetheless, these are all the same kind of nucleic acids, which are essentially sugars uh, with a sort of phosphate group attached to that. Um, and these are seen not just in our bodies, but they've also been seen uh, in um, asteroids. I talked a little bit about um, how some of these nucleobases are seen, for example, uh, in some of the carbonaceous asteroids that have been picked up here on the Earth. And so we think these are primordial molecules uh, that uh, were present at very early time. Now, other than being a really efficient information storage system, all right, our, D, our DNA contains something like uh, three gigabytes of data, uh, if you put it in that format, but it contains that three gigabytes data in about something the size of a micron across. That's pretty high storage density, even by today's terms. Um, but more importantly, that DNA is not just about information, but it actually is a code that maps to protein construction as well. Um, and so we talked very briefly about amino acids, but here are just some names of amino acids. You always know an amino acid because it has an ion at the end, usually. Remember, amino acids are the sort of building blocks of proteins. Proteins include enzymes, hemoglobin, all sorts of things that we use in our body. And there is literally a three-letter sort of code sequence in our DNA that matches to these various amino acids. So three of those codes will attach or attract individual amino acids. And so the sequence of our DNA is actually a sequence of building up uh, fairly complex proteins. Now, amazingly, we don't use, this is really just kind of a subset of the amino acids that are on nature. Something like 20 amino acids is what life uses on Earth. There's something really like 70 that are out there that you can synthesize. But for whatever reason, life doesn't use all 70 of those. It just uses these 20. But this is a code system. It's an amazing code system that maps DNA to protein. And this is how the body and how cells and all different organisms build up over time. So here's an example of a pretty important uh, protein, which is insulin, all right? It allows us to uh, process glucose. And these are the two pieces of protein that make up insulin. And all of these little three-letter words are different amino acids. And those amino acids line up to a code that looks like this. This is actually a DNA structure uh, that maps onto insulin. Right. Seems like a lot of gibberish, and this because all I'm doing is showing you letters. There's diff better ways to display this stuff, but this is the code that makes this protein. And the fact that we have that sort of one-to-one -one correspondence is actually pretty powerful. Of course, that's what gives rise to the complex uh, biochemistry we have in our lives. So um, yeah, is this how they like uh, decide how much this three gigabyte thing is? They just like write out the entire. Uh, so back in 2001, the Human Genome Project, and then there was this project by a um, rich guy that just built a building on UCSD campus. <laughs> was it? No. Um, 
the other rich guy, yeah. <laughs> One of the other rich guys. Um, sorry, it'll come to me later. But, but there were two efforts to map the human genome back in 2001. The, the Human Genome Project was actually a 13-year project, cost $3 billion, and map the human genome. We can now do that in something like $100,000 or $50,000 in a couple days. And that's probably even too expensive now. The goal is to get down to where we can do it for a thousand bucks in a few hours. And we're probably not that far off from that. But yeah, that sequence of letters is the three gigabytes. Okay. And I say most of these letters, we're in like 90% of the genetic code, we don't actually know what it does. It may be junk, it may be sort of doing other processes that don't necessarily map onto proteins. Right? There's whole sequences that are like the same letter and they don't do anything. So we don't quite know what all the human genome does, but we can find individual segments, and then we know that those map to specific proteins. And for example, uh, mutations on those proteins, uh, which change the amino acids, give rise to specific genetic diseases. So we have, you know, we're actually, I mean, this is a completely brand new world because we do have this map of how our human genome can, can create different proteins in our body. And it turns out the proteins in our body are one of the things that give rise to serious diseases, how those proteins are made or not. Made. And uh, do they yeah. have this like, available? Yeah, you can. So, I mean, I downloaded this is the NH, uh, NIH website. This I literally looked up insulin and copied the text file that had the genetic sequence. Yeah. Is it possible to like, take a section of that and then put in a different code in there? So, this is. This is gene splicing, and this is a whole area of research and business and ethical dilemma. Um, I should say simple <laughs> organisms do that actually all the time. So bacteria, we'll talk a little bit about the difference of prokaryotes and eukaryotes bacteria. The pro way bacteria sort of genetically evolve is they literally steal segments of DNA from each other and from the environment, and they just splice them in. And that completely changes bacteria on a very rapid scale. And that's why we have bacteria resistant and uh, uh, antibiotic resistant bacteria is bacteria can evolve very quickly because they're much more loose about their genetic code. It's harder for uh, complex organisms like humans to do that because we have a very specific mechanism of replication. We'll talk about in a second. But in principle, it's still possible. You had a question. Is the genetic code more like a fingerprint or are they all like more similar? Um, most, I mean, a huge fraction of our DNA is basically identical to each other. It doesn't matter what your race is. It doesn't matter between Homo sapiens and Neanderthals. Most of our DNA is similar. Most of our DNA is similar to all primates, uh, for example. It's usually very small differences in some proteins. Now, that being said, the genetic blueprint, there's a sort of a, a lot of uh, research now on an area called epigenetics. Because it's not just what genes you have, it's what genes get expressed. And so, um, you know, take for example, perfect twins, like the identical twins. They're split from the same fertilized egg, they have exactly the same genetic material, but you can have identical twins that look totally different, have different personalities, develop different diseases. So your genes are not your, you know, your fate. They do provide a map for some of the protein manufacturer, but whether those genes turn on or not is a whole other area of research that people are still trying to understand. Yeah. How much, like, like I don't know, how much of um, is that? Like, is it just like? Uh, but this would be mapping one one molecule in insulin. Oh, okay. Yeah, and then you know you repeat a billion times, trillion times, depending on which insulin body makes. Yeah. Other questions. All right, so, um, so, you know, this is really how the body makes proteins. Um, and in order to uh, pass on those, uh, you both to ma manufacture the proteins, but also to pass on the genetic material on, uh, there's a whole process of gene replication. Uh, again, I'm not going to go into great detail of this, but you know, the idea is you basically you, know, you have enzymes that can rip apart this DNA cell, attach other nucleobases together, now you've got a perfect copy of two DNA that can then split off uh, and form two cells, or part of this extra strand might form messenger RNA, which then goes off into the cell and actually manufactures the proteins that these genetic codes are, are matched to. So there's a whole machinery in our cells uh, to use this information both for protein synthesis and also replication. 
All right, now, the problem is that those replications don't always work. And so sometimes you get single nucleobase errors that can have uh, major shifts. And remember, those nucleobases map to amino acids. So um, this is a good sort of illustration. So if you have this sort of sequence of three letter words, which again might map onto five different amino acids, um, if you swap in a different letter, you get a very different sentence, but it's not that different, right? Most of it is the same. Um, if you insert a whole new sequence, again, you might have a different protein because now you've got this extra amino acid in there. Uh, probably the worst is if, for example, this T went away, the protein synthesis sort of machinery just goes three step, three layers by three layers, three layers, and this becomes gibberish if you do that. And so some of the most, um, you know, some of the worst mutations that happen in cells, uh, or at least in the sense of really changing the, the, the biochemistry of these kind of insertions or deletions, where you end up with a completely different protein because of the way that these genetic codes are read by, uh, by ribosomes or RNA. So, you know, something like sickle cell anemia uh, is just the switch of one T to one A in the very long genetic sequence for making hemoglobin. Right, one T to one A gives you a completely different, different cell, basically. Now, this is, you know, lots of mutations are bad for us, but of course, mutations are also the driver for evolution, right? Lots of mutations are bad because, you know, those changes might not be something that an organism can survive with. But occasionally, a mutation will come along that makes that organism more likely to survive or gives an advantage. And those are the ones that are passed on, and this is the whole process of evolution. Now, sometimes these just happen. Sometimes they're induced by things like carcinogens, right? That carcinogen is the generation of, you know, uh, generation of changes in the DNA. It's basically what that word means. Um, those could be chemicals, radioactivity, ultraviolet light can knock out genetic sequences and change uh, how those form. All these things can give rise to mutations or changes in that genetic code, which gives rise to changes in biochemistry. Um, okay, so. One of the things those, you know, we do know that there are sort of random mutations that happen. They happen at a relatively uh, even rate. I mean, this is actually three orders of magnitude difference, but the rate at which sort of normal mutations happen is actually an interesting way of mapping how much time has occurred since different genetic patterns have developed. And we call that sort of comparison of different gene sequences the genetic distance. And that's literally just comparing you know, the full gene sequence of one animal to another gene sequence of another animal and seeing how similar they are across the, the whole sequence. Now, this works pretty well in sort of similar kinds of animals, like all humans, for example, right? You can look and trace and see when different mutations have occurred. Um, it gets harder to do when you go across, like, bacteria to vertebrates or something like that. But this sort of process of looking at how these genetic changes occur over time are also matched to actual age dating of material in the, in the geological record. And what you get in the end is a map of essentially how all the organisms came about over time. Right? So this is our tree of life. And uh, this particular sort of format for how organisms have developed on Earth was developed in the 1970s. It gave rise to a completely new area of life called archaea which hadn't been recognized before that. But these three sort of kingdoms, bacteria, archaea, and you know, essentially all of us, all the animals on the planet and plants, um, originate from a common source that seems to be something like four, four billion years old or something like that. You can trace that back just from the genetic variations across the species. Right, so, so we, you know, we share a lot more in common with you know, things like lichens and fungi than we do with bacteria. So this begs the question, if we have this, if we can map this structure in life forms that are on Earth today, you know, how far back does this last ancestor go? And are there other ancestors that maybe, you know, form an earlier tree that just never made it out to the current day because they all got wiped out in some way, right? So these are some of the questions that people ask to figure out what is the actual origin of life and what form that would take. But it turns out that some of the earliest life forms in here are these archaea. And in particular, they're archaea that have, um, that are thermophilic. They can survive extremely high temperatures. 
These are examples of extreme files. Um, and a good example of a thermophile, which in fact sort of told, started the whole uh, business of understanding how extreme life forms form, uh, is up in Yellowstone National Park. Um, how many of you have been to Yellowstone National Park? So have you seen sort of these really colorful hot springs and stuff like that? Not at all. Okay. All right. Go, go back with color vision. <laughs> Um, a lot of people think that those colors are coming from the minerals that are being dissolved in the hot springs or maybe bubbling up from the sort of hot, hot spring underneath. But in fact, much of the color that you see in here is from little individual organisms of archaea that survive in very hot environments, thermophiles. Um, this is an example of a thermophile that lives deep in the ocean, uh, Methanopyrus candelari. Uh, this is found in thermal vents at the bottom of the Mid-Atlantic Ridge. And these organisms can survive up to 122 degrees Celsius. Now, if you know your Celsius scale, 122 degrees Celsius is surprising because it's what? What's that? It's above the boiling point of water. In the deep ocean, the pressure is such that you can have water that's above 100 degrees Celsius and still be liquid water, right? The pressure basically holds it together. Um, but no one would have expected to find things that could survive at such high temperatures, even at those pressures. And in fact, when we look at these deep thermal vents, they are some of the most uh, diverse uh, sort of light colonies that we find on the planet. And they appear to be some of the most, like the most basic organisms that we find on the planet, the earliest organisms on the planet. So there's a lot of evidence to suggest that these first organisms that came on the earth, however they did, came in areas where it was very hot, uh, perhaps underground because they're also chemo-autotrophs. And, um, and they thrive in these sort of very hot environments. And so we can trace that back to the origins of where the first organism came from. Now, this is life as we know it today, even the sort of the extreme forms of life as we know it today. Um, we can also try to trace back what happened before this in sort of prebiotic origins. Um, we know that there are uh, things called stromatolites uh, out in sort of Western Australia. Those things still exist, they're basically just photosynthetic bacteria that form these kind of microbial mats. Um, you know, you see kind of algae and mats and stuff like that here in the beaches uh, in La Jolla, but these are sort of much larger sort of structures of just very simple organisms, all making energy from photosynthesis. The rock record shows similar kind of mineral structures that appear to be laid down exactly the same way as the photosynthetic mats are made today. Uh, and so, and these are pretty old, three and a half billion years old. Earth is about four and a half billion years old. So this is not long after the Earth forms that we get photosynthetic life forms. Right? Life forms that can use energy from the sun and, and, and metabolize that. Um, we have other evidence of early life when we look at some of uh, the earliest rocks. Uh, we see uh, that the ratio of carbon-12 to carbon-14, these are different isotopes of carbon. Carbon-14 has two more neutrons than carbon-12. Life forms tend to like lighter isotopes because they're easier to incorporate in the body. It's less energy. Um, and so a lot of the carbon we use in our body is, pref is primarily carbon-12. We have a sort of a bias towards carbon-12 as a carbon species in our body. And in some rocks, we find that there's a higher ratio of carbon-12 to carbon-14, which suggests that those rocks may have had life in them at some point early on. And those go back to about 3.9 billion years. Uh, and then there's more controversial evidence of early life forms in things called microfossils, right? Little structures that are sort of left behind in rocks that could be up to 3 billion years old. This is probably the hardest, like, research in astrobiology because you look at, like, a big rock and you're looking for things that are, like, 5 microns in size and there might be one of them. I don't understand how anyone does this work, but they do. Uh, and it's very controversial because maybe this is actually something else, just like a little vein of mineral or something like that. Um, and we'll see another example of that from Mars in just a little bit. In any case, when you take out all of the sort of different evidences of very early life forms, it appears that life may have started about 3.8 billion years ago, which is really early on, right? Not too long after, for example, the moon formed, right, when the sort of theia impacted the Earth and created this moon. Uh, not long after that, you get the sort of first evidence of actually relatively advanced life forms, cellular life forms, appearing on the Earth. <clears throat> now, folks want to push even further back in time to see 
what could have origin, arisen before that. And this is now getting from, you know, sort of like little buggy bacteria stuff to what is the actual stuff that started uh, making those buggy bacteria stuff in the first place. So this is going down to the actual chemical origin of life. Um, and there's now a fairly uh, well uh, uh, accepted theory that the thing you really need, first of all, above anything else, is some kind of replicator molecule, some kind of molecule that can make itself. Right? Because once you can do that, A, you can make lots of copies of this thing so it can spread around, and you can start to have the precursors for natural selection, mutation, changes, development of complexity, et cetera. And so current theory is that RNA may be the original replicator molecule. Right? RNA is sort of the single strand of nucleic acids. Right? DNA is a double strand, double helix. Um, and there's work that shows that if you just take a bunch of nucleobases, RNA, and some clay, because that forms sort of a sort of a matrix in which RNA can sort of stick and stay in place. Uh, over time, you can start to develop complexity and eventually kick in some particular RNA molecule that is able to, to replicate itself. And in fact, in 1989, uh, there was a Nobel Prize awarded to the discovery of these things called ribozymes. Ribozymes are RNA strands that help RNA replicate itself. So these are little pieces of RNA that we have in our body. They're on the ribosomes. And they actually sort of interface with RNA and allow it to sort of grab these nucleobases, stick them on, and then create new, uh, new RNA sequences. So the belief is that it's these very early RNA enzymes all right, that can cut themselves, can replicate themselves, that were the first replicators that were sort of the origin, the chemical origin of life on Earth. We don't know this is true or not. This is not something that's been reproduced in the laboratory because it's a very rare event. And it's obviously not something that we can see in the geological record because these are molecules, right? We don't see molecules in the ge ge geological record. We barely see organisms. Um, this is actually, so, and this has been, there's been a lot of work on this in the last uh, sort of decade. This is just a, a Nature article from 2009 that talks about how you can go from some of the basic chemicals to some kind of intermediate stuff to the first RNA nucleotides. That's also sort of a step even further back. So RNA is the sort of the first replicator you have to ask where does the RNA come from. And now we think that we can make RNA just from very basic chemistry. So there seems to be at least a chemical train that can get us from just the chemicals of the environment to something that replicates to something that's more complex. Although there's a lot of steps in between that folks are still trying to figure out. Um, another important part, so I should take a step back here. Um, so this is kind of a simplified view of how we think life originated on Earth, or at least how might like biologists uh, think life originated on Earth. Um, you start with some kind of naturally abundant chemicals, chemicals that may have been deposited on Earth from meteorites, for example. We know that carbohydrates, amino acids, and nucleobases are found on a meteorite. So just having that stuff around in some kind of poof, you get some, uh, some life forms. Um, that may have led to a world in which RNA was able to self-replicate, that RNA might find itself in membranes where it can start to make more complex proteins and molecules, eventually you get something that's like a very basic bacterial or archaea cell, uh, and then you get something that's much more complex like, like eukaryotic life. Um, this is still a lot of work in progress. People are still trying to put the pieces together of this, um, but at least is a compelling source of chemical origin of life, um, as opposed to life just kind of magically showing up. Um, these simple cells, these archaea, are only one type of cell that we have to see here on Earth. We can actually divide sort of all life forms into really two different types of cells. Uh, the prokaryotes, which are bacteria, which are very simple, right? Their nucleic material is just kind of floating around inside the cell. They have some number of ribosomes, maybe they have a little tail to move around, but they're very simple um, cellular organisms. Uh, whereas the cells we have in our body and that plants have in their body are much more complex. Many different structures in the cell, mitochondria, chloroplasts, lots of things that help in sort of the cellular machinery, and our DNA is contained in the nucleus as opposed to just floating around uh, in the cell itself. And the whole rise of this particular cellular structure um, is known as endosymb endosymbosis, um, and the belief is that we actually started as something simple and actually incorporated other prokaryotes 
into our cells. And a good example is mitochondria. I mentioned before that mitochondria are sort of the energy metabolism uh, sort of parts of our cell. Uh, the belief is that those are actually separate organisms that were sort of engulfed all right, by a cell and then stayed put. And it turned out that it was a wonderful relationship. Right? So the most mitochondria were able to generate the energy. Uh, same thing with chloroplasts, chlor chloroplasts in, um, in plant cells. Chloroplasts are basically just simple cyanobacteria. But at some point, those cyanobacteria got absorbed into a cell, and now they generate the energy in plant cells. All of this happened somewhere around 2 billion years, roughly, ago. Um, as soon as these complex cells come into being, you start to get a huge explosion in multicellular life. Right? Not just single little cells like amoeba, but now you start to get chains and colonies of cells that match together. And it doesn't take much long after that, at least in geological time, uh, to get to even more complicated animal uh, and plant species. And so around 500 million years ago, we see this huge explosion in life, of animal life, particularly in the oceans. The land hadn't really been settled at this point. It was still a very hostile environment. But you get this sort of huge explosion in life as a result. Now, I should say, one of the reasons that this comes about is that those early cyanobacteria Again, using photosynthesis, right? We talked a little bit about biochemistry a couple days ago. Take that, you know, take things that are in the environment, water and carbon dioxide and a little energy, and start to produce structure, right? Glucose, carbohydrates is structure. And one of the outcomes is that is, is oxygen is a waste product. Well, oxygen is indeed a waste product, at least in this early atmosphere. And we, we see in the geological record somewhere around two and a half billion years ago, the oxygen in the atmosphere changes suddenly from basically not being there to becoming quite high. In fact, sometime early in the past, the oxygen in the atmosphere was higher than it is today, something like 30, 32% of the atmosphere was oxygen. Um, this was a huge change to our climate, and it's a huge change to our climate caused by microbes, by photosynthetic microbes. But it was a necessary change to our environment because that oxygen, if you're a chemist, oxygen is a, you know, oxidation is a great way of extracting energy. And so animals developed this process of taking that oxygen and sugar that they could eat, which is really eating the plants and little bugs and stuff like that, and producing energy plus the carbon dioxide, which is then given back to the most supposed synthetic plants to produce structures. So it's about a billion and a half years ago that you start to see this sort of um, symbiotic relationship between producers, which are the plants that take energy from the sun and produce structure, and consumers, which are us, that take structure and extract energy from it through oxidation. This whole process sort of takes, again, about two, two billion years ago. All right, now for lack of time, I'm going to get to the end of this because uh, there's a lot of the history that I won't go into. Um, but once you start getting plants and animals, you get the chance of actually having them respond to greater events in the, in the, in the environment. Um, so. We talked about the dinosaurs uh, being wiped out by asteroid impacts. Asteroids may have had a more of an effect than other animals. Uh, in fact, we see at least uh, six different major impact, uh, extinction events in our geological record. This is just a matter of counting the number of, of animals and species and genera that are in the geological record. Um, the KT extinction is the one that killed the dinosaurs off. That was about 65 million years ago. But that actually wasn't the worst one. The worst one was this one, Permian extinction. This is wipe out of about 90% of all life on Earth. There's some event that we're still not entirely sure what was the cause of it. It could have been an asteroid impact, it could have been volcanism, it could have been a huge release of sulfur dioxide, and uh, sorry, sul uh, hydrogen sulfide and uh, methane in the atmosphere. We're still not quite sure what happens here. Almost all life on Earth wipes out. Almost all complex life on Earth gets wiped out. As far as we know, most of these extinction events had very little impact on the microbes themselves. Part of it, we can't really measure it. It's very hard to measure the sort of geological record of microbes. But from what we can tell in terms of the sort of survivability of extremophiles that can survive in space, extreme heat, extreme cold, the microbial part of Earth probably survived most of these extinctions mostly unscathed. So while we look at the extinction record to see how complex life like us would respond to huge geological disasters, Keep in mind that microbial life on Earth just keeps going. So as we think about life on other planets, 
you know, no matter what happens sort of in terms of sort of, you know, major disasters, earthquakes, asteroids, stuff like that, microbial life is probably something that if it manages to find itself on a planet, doesn't go away too, too, quick, too quickly. Okay, so I'm going to stop there. Um, <clears throat> Let's see, don't forget to start thinking about your project proposals. If you have questions about it, I'll have office hours on 